Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show, and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about Lord Lucan. So Richard John Bingham, the 7th Earl of Lucan, commonly known as Lord Lucan, was a British peer who disappeared after being suspected of murder. He was an Anglo-Irish aristocrat, the eldest son of George Bingham, 6th Earl of Lucan, by his wife Kate Lindawson. Lucan was an evacuee during the Second World War, but returned to attend Eton College and served with the Coldstream Guards in West Germany from 1953 to 1955. Having developed a taste for gambling, he played backgammon and bridge and was an early member of the Claremont Club. Lucan's loss often exceeded his winnings, yet he left his job at a London-based merchant bank and became a professional gambler. He was known as Lord Bingham from April 1949 until January 1964 during his father's lifetime. Lucan was considered for the role of James Bond in the cinematic adaptions of Ian Fleming's novels. He was known for his expensive tastes. He raced powerboats and drove an Aston Martin. In 1963, Lucan married Veronica Duncan, with whom he had three children. The couple moved home to 46 Lower Belgrave Street in Belgravia in 1967, paying £17,500 for the house. After the marriage collapsed in late 1972, he moved out to a nearby property. A bitter custody battle ensued, which Lucan eventually lost. Apparently obsessed with regaining custody of the children, Lucan began to spy on his wife and record their telephone conversations. This fixation, combined with mounting legal expenses and gambling losses, had a dramatic effect on Lucan's life and personal finances. Now we're going to get into a bit of his early life and education. So, Richard John Bingham was born on the 18th of December 1934 at 19 Bentonick Street, Marylebone, London. The second child and eldest son of George Bingham, 6th Earl of Lucan, and English Iro Pierre and his wife, Elizabeth Caitlin Elizabeth Ann Dawson. A blood clot found in his mother's lung forced her to remain in a nursing home. Sir John, as he became known, was initially cared for by the family's nursemaid, Lucy Sellers. Aged three years, John attended a pre-prep school in Tite Street with his elder sister, Jane. In 1939, with the Second World War approaching, the two were taken to the relative safety of Wales. In 1940, joined by their younger siblings, Sally and Hugh, the Lucan children travelled to Toronto in Canada, moving shortly thereafter to Mount Kisco, New York, in the United States. They stayed for five years with multimillionaires, Nares Masia Brady Tucker. John was enrolled at the Harvey School and spent summer holidays away from his siblings at a summer camp in the Ardendak Mountains. Mountains. While in the US, John and his siblings lived in grandeur and wanted for nothing. But on their return to England in February of 1945, they were faced with the stark realities of wartime Britain. Rationing was still in force, their former home at Chen Walk had been bombed, and the family's house at 22 Eaton Square had its windows blown out. Despite the family's noble ancestry, the sixth Earl and his wife were agnostics and socialists who preferred a more austere existence than that offered by Tucker, an extremely wealthy Christian. For a time, John suffered nightmares and was taken to a psycho therapist. As an adult, he remained an agnostic, but ensured that his children attended Sunday school, preferring to give them a traditional childhood. At Eton College, John developed a taste for gambling. He supplemented his pocket money with income from bookmaking, placing his earnings into a secret bank account, and regularly left the school grounds to attend horse races. According to his mother, John's academic record was far from creditable, but he became captain at Ralph Rowe's house before leaving in 1953 to undertake his national service. He became a second lieutenant in his father's regiment, the Coldstream Guards, and was stationed mainly in Critfield, West Germany. And while there, he also became a keen poker player. Now we're going to get move on to his career. So, on leaving the British Army in 1954, Lucan joined William Bratt's Sons & Co., a London-based merchant bank, on an annual salary of £500. In 1960, he met Stephen Raffinell, a rich stockbroker who was a skilled backgammon player. They holidayed together in the Bahamas, went water skiing, and played golf backgammon and poker. Lucan became a regular gambler and an early member of John Aspinell's Claremont Gaming Club located in Berkeley Square. 
Now, the Claremont Club has an interesting history, and all was not as it seems. Behind the scenes, a gigantic con was being played on hundreds of unsuspecting gamblers, a scam devised by the Marseilles Mafia, but which led to millions being shared by the unlikely and secret partnership of the ultra-snobbish Aspinall and London's biggest underworld boss, Billy Hill. Now, look, everyone knows that gambling is a dodgy business and that the bookie always wins. Yet, for years, London's smart society would gather trustingly at John Aspinall's discreet gaming table. If author Douglas's Thompson's sources for his book are to be believed, according to John Burke, who was once the Claremont's financial director, Aspinall was a successful thief and an even cleverer con man. The Claremont con, as it became known, was brilliant. Marked cards and chemin de fur, the fashionable game of the time, would have been too easy to spot. So a small mangle-like machine was constructed, which would bend the Claremont's customised cards a fraction, one way or the other, to denote their value. Then the cards would be put back into their cellar fane wrapper, sealed as new, and delivered to the Claremont Club for the night's gaming. All it took then was for a trained reader to sit in at the game secretly for the house. Basically, this is a more sophisticated version of a card counting scheme. Since he was alone, he could diminish the approximate value of what the cards other players received were, and he could deduce which hand was more likely to win and make his calls accordingly. Because the bins in the cards were so tiny, it wasn't foolproof, but it gave the house a continuous 60-40% edge, and that, as the months went by turned into millions to be divided between Aspinall and Billy Hill. On the first night of the operation alone, the tax-free winnings for the house were about £14,000. That's £280,000 in today's money. Even in Aspinall's standards, that was big money, but he'd been conning it since the mid-50s when, having spotted an opportunity at a time when running a gaming house was against the law, he'd begun holding illegal private gambling parties at rich friends' homes in Belgravia. One night in 1958, land owner Lord Derby, who Aspinall seems to have considered his private piggy bank for the raiding, lost over £20,000 at an illegal chim de fur party. Obviously, other players won, while Aspinall and his team made £19,401 from the cover charge for organising the event. As John Burke, who has kept the records, calculates, in 2007 money, this might be presented as a tax-free half a million pounds earnings for a night's work. End quote. Aspinall remembered how now as much for his private zoo as his clubs does not come out well out of this fascinating book, but then nor do most people in it. Then there's Lord Bothamy, who had an affair with Dorothy McMillan, the wife of the Prime Minister, as well as with villain Ronnie Cray. Burke's records show Bothaby illegally winning £2,160 one night in 1958. And there's also the tragic Dominic Luz, who would commit suicide when he was dropped by Aspinall and his other posh pals. Aspinall also, when finding himself $200,000 in debt to an old friend, tried to cheat him at cards in order to pay him back. The friend, however, spotted the con. Lucan often won at games of skill like backgammon and bridge, but he also accumulated huge losses. For example, on one occasion, Lucan lost £8,000, or about two-thirds of the money he received annually, from various family trusts. On another disastrous night at a casino, he lost £10,000. His uncle by marriage, stockbroker John Bevan, helped him to pay that particular debt off, and Lucan repaid his uncle two years later. Lucan left Brant's around 1960, shortly after he had won £26,000 playing Chim de Fur. This is also how he got the nickname of Lucky, or Lucky Lucan as he was called. A colleague had been promoted before him, leading Lucan to leave his job in protest, saying, and I quote, Why should I work in a bank when I can earn a year's money in one single night at the tables? End quote. Now, Lucan travelled to the US where he played golf, raced powerboats, and drove his Aston Martin around the West Coast. He also visited his elder sister Jane and his former guardian, Marcia Tucker. On his return to England, he moved out of his parents' home in St. John's Wood and into a flat in Park Crescent. Now we get on to his marriage. So, Lucan met his future wife, Veronica Duncan, early in 1963. She was born in 1937 to Major Charles Morehouse Duncan and his wife Thelma. Veronica's father had died in a car accident when she was young, after which the family moved to South Africa. Her mother remarried and her family returned to England, where her new stepfather became manager of a hotel in Guildford. With her sister Christina, she was educated at St. Swithun's School, Winchester. After displaying a talent for art, Victoria went on to study at an art college in Bournemouth. The two sisters later shared a flat in London where Veronica worked as a model and later as a secretary. Christina's marriage to the wealthy William Shand Kidd, half-brother to Peter Shand Kidd, stepfather to Diana Spencer, later Princess of Wales, introduced her to London High Society and it was at a golf function in the country that Veronica and Lucan first met. 
News of their engagement appeared in the Times and the Daily Telegraph newspapers on the 14th of October 1963, and the two were married at Holy Trinity Church Brompton on the 20th of November. After a ceremony attended by Princess Alice, Countess of Athlon, one of whose ladies-in-waiting had been a relative of Lady Lucan, but by few other prominent members of high society, the couple honeymooned in Europe, travelling first class on the Orient Express. Lucan's already em embattled finances were given a welcome boost by his father, who provided him with a marriage settlement designed to finance a large family home and any future additions to the Lucan family. Lucan repaid some of his creditors and purchased 46 Lower Belgrave Street in Belgravia, redecorating it to suit Veronica's tastes. Two months after the wedding, on the 21st of January 1964, Lucan's father died of a stroke. In addition to a reputed £250,000 inheritance, Lucan acquired his father's titles. Earl of Lucan, Baron Lucan of Castle Bar, Baron Lucan of Melcombe, Lucan and Baronet Bingham of Castle Bear, and his wife became the Countess of Lucan. The couple then went on to have three children. They were Lady Frances Bingham, born on the October 24th of 1964, Lord George Bingham, born on September 21st of 1967, and Lady Camilla Bingham, born on June 30th of 1970. Following the 1964 birth of their first daughter, Frances, from early in 1965, they employed a nanny, Lillian Jenkins, to look after her. Lucan tried to teach Veronica about gambling and traditional pursuits like hunting, shooting, and fishing. He bought her golf lessons. She later gave up the sport, however. Lucan's daily routine consisted of breakfast at 9am, coffee, dealing with the morning's letters, reading the newspapers, and playing the piano. He sometimes jogged in the park and took his Doberman pincer for walks. Lunch at the Claremont Club was followed by afternoon games at backgammon. Returning home to change into evening dress, the Earl typically spent the remainder of the day at the Claremont gambling into the early hours, watched sometimes by Veronica. In 1956, while still working at Bratz, he had written of his desire to have £2 million in the bank, claiming that motor cars, yachts, expensive holidays and security for the future would give myself and a lot of other people a lot of pleasure. End quote. Lucan was described by his friends as a shy and taciturn man, but with his tall stature, luxuriant guardsman's moustache, and masculine pursuits, his exploits made him popular. His profligacy extended to hiring private aircraft to take his friends to the races, asking a car dealer he knew to source an Aston Martin drophead coupe, drinking expensive Russian vodka, and racing powerboats. In September of 1966, he unsuccessfully screen-tested for a part in Woman Times 7, prompting him to decline a later offer from film producer Albert R. Broccoli to screen-test him for the role of James Bond. As a professional gambler, Lucan was a skilled player once rated amongst the world's top 10 backgammon competitors. He won at the St. James Club Tournament and was champion of the West Coast of America. He gained the moniker Lucky Lucan, but his losses easily outweighed his winnings, and in reality, he was anything but lucky. Lucan had interest in thoroughbred horses, and in 1968, he paid more in race entry fees than he received in winnings. Despite some arguments over money, Veronica remained largely ignorant of his losses, retaining the use of accounts at Savile Row Tailors and various Knightsbridge shops. Following the births of George and Camilla, Veronica suffered postnatal depression. Lucan became increasingly involved in her mental well-being, and in 1971 took her for treatment in a psychiatric clinic in Hampstead, where she refused to be admitted. Instead, she agreed to home visits from a psychiatrist and a course of antidepressants. In June 1972, the family holidayed in Monte Carlo, but Veronica quickly returned to England, leaving Lucan with their two elder children. The combined pressures of maintaining their finances, the costs of Lucan's gambling addiction, and Veronica's weakened mental condition took a toll on the marriage. Two weeks after a strained family Christmas in 1972, Lucan moved into a small property in Eaton Row. Some months after Lucan moved again to a larger flat rented nearby in Elizabeth Street. Despite an early attempt by his wife at reconciliation, by that point all Lucan wanted from the marriage was custody of his children. In an effort to demonstrate that Veronica was unfit to look after them, Lucan began to spy on his family. His car was regularly seen parked in Lower Belgrave Street and later deploying private detectives to perform the same task. He also canvassed doctors who explained that his wife had not gone mad but was suffering from depression and anxiety. Lucan told friends that nobody would work for Veronica. She had sacked Jenkins, the children's long-term nanny in December of 1972, and of the series of nannies employed in the house, one 26-year-old Stefana Savica was told by Veronica that Lucan had hit her with a cane and had on one occasion pushed her down the stairs. The Countess apparently feared for her safety and told Savica not to be surprised if he kills me one day, end quote. 
Sir Whitgar's time at the Lucan household ended in late March of 1973. While with two of the children near Grosnevar Place, she was confronted by Lucan and two private detectives. They told her that the children had been made wards of the state and that she must release them into his custody, which she did. Francis was collected from his school later in the day. Veronica replied to the court to have the children returned, but concerned about the case's complexity, the judge set a date for the hearing three months ahead for June 1973. To defend herself against Lucan's claims about her mental state, Veronica booked herself a four-day stay at the Priory Clinic in Roehampton. While it was acknowledged that she was still required some psychiatric support, the doctors reported that there was no indication that she was mentally ill. Lucan's case depended upon Veronica being unable to care for the children, but at the hearing he was instead forced to defend his own behaviour towards her. After several weeks of witnesses and protracted arguments in camera on the advice of his lawyers, he conceded the case. Unimpressed by Lucan's character, Mr. Justice Rees awarded custody to Veronica. The Earl was allowed access every other weekend. Thus began a bitter dispute between the couple involving many of their friends and Veronica's own sister. Lucan again began to watch his wife's movements and he even went as far as to record some of their telephone conversations with a small Sony tape recorder and played excerpts to any friends prepared to listen. He also told them and his bank manager that Veronica had been spending money like water. End quote. Lucan continued to pay the £40 a week and may have cancelled their regular food order with Harrods. He delayed payment to the milkman and knowing that Veronica was required by the court to employ a live-in nanny, the childcare agency. With no income of her own, Veronica took a part-time job in a local hospital. A temporary nanny, Elizabeth Murphy, who was befriended by Lucan, who bought her drinks and asked for information on his wife. He instructed his detective agency to investigate Murphy, looking for evidence that she was failing in her duty of care to his children. This they found. He dispensed with the detective agency's services when they presented him with bills amounting to several hundred pounds. Murphy was later hospitalized with cancer. Another temporary nanny, Christabel Martin, reported strange phone calls to the house, some with heavy breathing and some from a man asking for non-existent people. Following a series of temporary nannies, Sandra Rivette started working in late 1974. Now we get to Lucan's gambling. So, losing the court case proved devastating for Lucan. It had cost him an estimated £20,000, and by late 1974, his financial position was dire. As he drank more heavily and started chain smoking, his friends began to worry. In drunken conversations with some of them, including Aspinall's mother, Lady Osborne, and her son, Lucan discussed murdering his wife. Greville Howard later gave a statement to the police describing how Lucan had talked of how killing his wife might save him from bankruptcy, how her body might be disposed of in the saloon, Lent and how he would, and I quote, never be caught. Lucan borrowed £4,000 from his mother and asked Tucker for a loan of £100,000. Having no luck there, he wrote to Tucker's son explaining how he wished to buy his children from Veronica. The money was not forthcoming, however. He turned to his friends and acquaintances, asking anyone plausible to loan him money to fund his gambling addiction. The financer, James Goldsmith, guaranteed a 5000 overdraft for him, which for years remained unpaid. Lucan also applied to the discreet Edgewood Trust. On request, he supplied details of his income, which was apparently around £12,000 a year from various family trusts. Lucan was required to provide a surety and received only £3,000 of the £5,000 he asked for. Much to their manager's consternation, his four bank accounts were overdrawn. Couts, which was £2,841. Lloyd's, which was £4,379, National Westminster, which was £1,290, and Midlands, which was £5,667. Even though by then he was playing for much lower stakes than he had previously been the case, Lucan's gambling remained completely out of control. Rants and estimates that between September and October of 1974 alone, the Earl ran up debts of around £50,000. Now, I'm going to butcher this name, but Tacky Theodorakopoulos, who recalled Lucan as a close friend for more than a decade, lent £3,000 in cash three nights before the murder. Despite these problems, from late 1974, Lucan's demeanour appeared to change for the better. His best man, John Wilbraham, remarked that Lucan's apparent obsession over regaining his children had diminished. While having dinner with his mother, he cast aside talk of his family problems and turned instead to politics. On November 6th, he met his uncle John Bevan, apparently in good spirits. Later that day, he met 21-year-old Charlotte Adrena Colquin, who said that he seemed very happy, just his usual self, and there was nothing to suggest that he was worried or depressed. End quote. He also dined at the Claremont with racing driver Graham Hill. 
At the time, casinos could only be open between 2 p.m. and 4 a.m., so Lucan often gambled into the early hours of the morning. He took tablets to deal with his insomnia and therefore usually awoke around lunchtime. On the 7th of November, though, he broke routine and called a solicitor early that morning and at 10.30 a.m. took a call from Coughlin. They arranged to eat at the Claremont at around 3 p.m., but Lucan failed to appear. Coughlin drove past the Claremont and Lab Broke Clubs and past Elizabeth Street, but it could not find Lucan's car anywhere. Lucan also failed to arrive for his 1pm lunch appointment with artist Dominic Hughes and banker Daniel Mertzhagen, again at the Claremont. At 4pm, Lucan called at a chemist on Lower Belgrave Street close to Veronica's home and asked the pharmacist there to identify a small capsule. It turned out to be Limbrittle 5, a drug for the treatment of anxiety and depression. Lucan had apparently made several similar visits since he separated from his wife. However, he never told the pharmacist where he got the drugs, and it was never established where he got them either. At 4.45pm, he called a friend literacy agent, Michael B Hicks Beach, and between 6.30pm and 7pm met with him at his flat on Elizabeth. Elizabeth Street. Lucan wanted his help with an article on gambling he had been asked to write for an Oxford University magazine. Lucan drove Hicks Beach home at about 8pm, not in his Mercedes Benz, but in an old, dark and scruffy Ford, possibly a Ford Corsair he borrowed from Michael Stoop several weeks earlier. At 8.30pm, he called the Claremont to check on a reservation for dinner with Grenville Howard and friends. Howard had called him at 5.15pm and asked if he wished to come to the theatre, but Lucan had declined and made the alternative suggestion to meet at the Claremont at 11pm. He failed to arrive and did not answer his phone when called. So we're going to get into the whole murder of Sandra Rivette. So Sandra Eleanor Rivette was born on the 16th of September 1945, the third child of Albert and Eunice Hensby. The family moved to Australia when she was two years old, but returned in 1955. Sandra was a popular child, described at school as intelligent, although she does not excel academically. End quote. She worked for six months as an apprentice hairdresser before taking a job as a secretary in Croydon. After a failed romance, Sandra became a voluntary patient at a mental hospital near Red Hill, Surrey, where she was treated for depression. She became engaged to a builder named John and took a job as a children's nanny for a doctor in Croydon. On the 13th of March 1964, she gave birth to a boy named Stefan, but as her relationship with John was failing, she returned home to live with her parents and considered giving the baby up for adoption. Her parents took on the responsibility and adopted him in May of 1965. Sandra later worked at a home for the elderly before moving to Portsmouth to stay with her older sister. While there, she met Roger Rivette. The two married on the 10th of June 1967 in Croydon. Roger was serving as a Royal Navy able seaman and later worked as a loader for British Road Services, while Sandra worked part-time at Reedham Orphanage in Purely. In mid-1973, he took a job as an SO tanker, returning to their flat in Kenley a few months later, by which time Sandra was employed by a cigarette company in Croydon. The marriage sadly collapsed in May of 1974 when, suspicious of Sandra's movements while he was away, Roger went to live with his parents. She was by then listed on the books of a Belgravia domestic agency and had been caring for an elderly couple in that district. A few weeks later, she began to work for the Lucans. Now, Sandra normally went out with her boyfriend John Hankins on Thursday nights, but had changed her night off and had seen him the previous day. The two last spoke on the telephone at about 8pm on the 7th of November. After putting the younger children to bed at about 8.55pm, she asked Veronica if she would like a cup of tea before heading downstairs to the basement kitchen to make one. As she entered the room, Sandra was bludgeoned to death with a piece of bandaged lead pipe. Her killer then placed her body into a canvas mail bag. Meanwhile, wondering what had delayed her nanny, Lady Lucan descended from the first floor to see what happened. She called to Rivette from the top of the basement stairs and was herself attacked. As she screamed for her life, her attacker told her to shut up. Lady Lucan later claimed at that moment to have recognised her husband's voice. The two apparently continued to fight. She bit his fingers, and when he threw her face down to the carpet, managed to turn around and squeeze his testicles, causing him to release his grip on her throat and give up the fight. When she asked where Rivette was, Lucan was at first evasive, but eventually admitted to having killed her. Terrified, Lady Lucan told him she could help him escape if only he would remain at the house for a few days to allow her injuries to heal. Lucan walked upstairs and sent his daughter to bed, then went into one of the bedrooms. When Veronica entered to lie on the bed, he told her to put towels down first to avoid staining the bedding. Lucan asked her if she had any barbiturates and went to the bathroom to get a wet towel, supposedly to clean Veronica's face. Lady Lucan realised her husband would be unable to hear her from the bathroom and made her escape, running outside to a nearby public house, the Plumber's Arms. 
Lucan may have arrived at the Chester Square home of Madeleine Florman, mother of one of Francis's school friends, sometime between 10pm and 10.30pm. Alone in the house, Florman ignored the door, but shortly afterwards she received an incoherent telephone call and put the receiver down. Bloodstains, which after forensic examination were found to be a mixture of blood groups A and B, were later discovered on her doorstep. Lucan certainly called his mother between 10.30pm and 11pm and asked her to to collect the children from Lower Belgrave Street. According to the Dalga Countess, he spoke of a terrible catastrophe at his wife's home. He told her that he had been driving past the house when he saw Veronica fighting with a man in the basement. He had entered the property and found his wife screaming. The location from which Lucan made this call and possibly the call to Florman remains unknown, which is just another unanswered question in this intriguing mystery. The police forced their way into Lady Lucan's home and discovered Rivette's body before his wife was taken by ambulance to St. George's Hospital. Lucan drove the Ford Corsair 42 miles or 68 kilometers to Ukefield, East Sussex to visit his friends, the Maxwell Scots. Susan Maxwell Scott's meeting with Lucan was his last confirmed sighting. Now we get into the police investigation. So, by the time the Chief Detective Superintendent Roy Ranson arrived at Lower Belgrave Street early on November 8th, the divisional surgeon had pronounced Rivet dead, and forensic officers and photographers had been called to the property. Other than the front door, which the first two officers on the scene had kicked in, there was no sign of a forced entry. A bloodstained towel was found in Veronica's first floor bedroom. The area around the top of the basement staircase was heavily bloodstained. A bloodstained lead pipe lay on the floor, and pictures hanging from the staircase walls were askew and a metal banister rail was damaged. At the foot of the stairs, two cups and saucers lay in pools of blood. Rivette's arm protruded from the canvas sack, which lay in a slowly expanding pool of blood. The light fitting at the bottom of the stairs was missing its bulb. One was noted nearby on a chair. Blood was also found on various leaves in the adjoining rear garden. Officers also searched Five Eaton Row, into which Lucan had moved early in 1973, and after interviewing his mother, who had called to take the children to a home in St. John's Wood, his last address at 72A Elizabeth Street. Nothing untoward was found on the bed, a suit and a shirt lay alongside a book on Greek shipping millionaires, and Lucan's wallet, car keys, money, driving license, handkerchief and spectacles were on a bedside table. His passport was in a drawer and his blue Mercedes-Benz parked outside, its engine cold and its battery flat. Ransom then visited Lady Lucan at St. George's Hospital, and although heavily sedated, she was able to describe what had happened to her. A police officer was left to guard her should her assailant return. Rivette's body was taken to the mortuary, and a search was undertaken of all local basement areas and gardens, skips, and open spaces. After removing her corpse from the canvas sack and beginning the post-mortem examination, pathologist Keith Simpson told Ranson he was certain that Rivette had been killed before her body was placed in the sack, and that, in his opinion, the lead pipe found at the scene could be the murder weapon. Her estranged husband, Roger, had an alibi for the night concerned, and was eliminated from police inquiries. Other male friends and boyfriends were questioned and discounted as suspects. Rivette's parents confirmed that she had a good working relationship with Lady Lucan and was extremely fond of the children. Meanwhile, Lucan had yet to make an appearance and so his description was circulated to police forces across the country. Newspapers and television stations were told only that Lucan was wanted by the police for questioning. Hours earlier, Lucan had again called his mother at about 12.30am. He told her that he would be in touch later that day, but declined to speak with the police constable who had accompanied her to a flat. Instead, he said he would call the police later that morning. Ranson discovered that Lucan had travelled to Ukefield when he was called by Ian Maxwell Scott, who told him that Lucan had arrived at his home a few hours after the murder and spoken with his wife Susan. While there, the Earl had written two letters to his brother-in-law, Bill Shan Kidd, and posted them to his London addresses. Maxwell Scott also called Shan Kidd at his country house near Lighton Bazaar and told him about the letters, prompting the latter to immediately drive to London to collect them. After reading them and noting that they were bloodstained, he took them to ransom. Here is the contents of those letters. 7th of November 1974. Dear Bill, the most ghastly circumstances arose tonight which I briefly described to my mother. When I interrupted the fight at Lower Belgrave Street and the man left Veronica accused me of having hired him. I took her upstairs and sent Frances up to bed and tried to clean her up. She laid doggo for a bit and when I was in the bathroom left the house. The circumstantial evidence against me is strong and that V will say it was all my doing. I will also lie doggo for a bit but I'm only concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. Couts, trustees, St. Martin 
Martin's Lane, Mr. Wall, will handle school fees. V has demonstrated a hatred for me and in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Yours forever, John. Financial matters. There is a sale coming up at Christie's 27th of no November which will satisfy bank overdrafts. Please agree reserves with Tom Craig. Proceeds to go to Lloyd's 6 Pal Mall, Couts 59 Strand, Nats West Bloomsbury Branch. Also hold an EQ and law life policy. The other creditors can get lost for the time being. Lucky. When asked why she did not immediately inform the police of Lucan's presence, Susan said she had not seen any newspapers or television news or listened to any radio broadcasts that might have warned her of the importance of his visit. Meanwhile, Lucan's children were also taken by their aunt Lady Sarah Gibbs to a home in Gillsborough, Northamptonshire, where they would remain for several weeks. On the day Lady Lucan was discharged from hospital, a high court hearing confirmed that the children could return to live with her. Repeated press intrusions later forced the family to move to a friend's home in Plymouth. The Ford Corsair that Lucan had been seen driving and whose details the previous day had been circulated across the country was found on the 10th of November in Norman Road, New Haven, about 16 miles, 26 kilometers from Yukefield. In its boot was a piece of lead pipe covered in surgical tape and a full bottle of vodka. The car was removed for forensic examination and later statements from two witnesses suggested that it was parked there sometime between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. on the morning of the 8th of November. Its owner, Michael Stopp, also received a letter from Lucan delivered to his club, the St. James. However, stooped through the envelope away and it was therefore not possible to check its postmark to see where it had been sent from. This is what the letter said. My dear Michael, I have had a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence. However, I won't bore you with anything or involve you except to say that when you come across my children, which I hope you will, please tell them that you knew me and that all I cared about was them. The fact that a crook solicitor and a rotten psychiatrist destroyed me between them will be of no importance to the children. I give Bill Shan Kidd an account of what actually happened, but judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe, and I no longer care except that my children should be protected. Yours ever, John. Ranson suspected a suicide, but a thorough search of New Haven Downs was judged impossible. A partial search was made using tracker dogs. All that was found was the skeletal remains of a judge who'd disappeared years earlier. Police divers searched the harbour, and a partial search using infrared photography was undertaken the following year, however to no avail. A warrant for Lucan's arrest to answer charges of murdering Sandra Rivette and attempting to murder his wife were issued on the 12th of November. Descriptions of his appearance already issued to police forces across the UK were then issue to Interpol. Now we're going to get into some forensics in the case, and this is where things get very interesting. The forensic examination of the lead pipes found at the murder scene and in the Corsair's boot revealed traces of blood on the pipe from 46 Lower Belgrave Street. This proved to be a mixture of Lady Lucan's blood type group A and Rivette's B blood. Hair belonging to Lady Lucan was also found on that pipe, but none to belonging to Rivette. The pipe found inside the Corsair had neither blood nor hair on it. The bit that intrigued me was that the Home Office scientists were unable to prove conclusively that both pipes were cut from the same long longer piece of pipe, although they thought it likely. Had this case ever gone to trial, this in my mind would have been a point of contention. The tape wrapped around both was similar, but those two could not be conclusively linked. The letter written to Kid was stained with blood considered to be from both women. The letter to Stoop had no blood on it, but it was later proven that the paper it was written on had been torn from a writing pad found in the Corsair's boot. An examination of the blood stains found inside 46 Lower Belgrave Street demonstrated that Rivette had been attacked in the base kitchen, while Lady Lucan had been attacked at the top of the basement stairs. The blood stains found inside the Corsair were of the AB blood group. The report concluded that this might have been a mixture of blood from both women. Hair similar to Lady Lucan's was also found inside the car. By the afternoon of 8th of November, the newspaper's early editions carried photographs of the Lucans across their front pages accompanied by headlines like Body in Sack, Countess Runs Out Screaming, and Belgravia Murder, Earl Sort. A meeting that day at the Claremont between Aspinall, Mertz Hagen, Kidd, Luz, Charles Benson and Stephen Raffnell became the cause of much press speculation. 
Mainz Hagen and Raphnell later insisted that the gathering was just a rational discussion between concern concerned friends keen to share anything they knew about what had happened. But the relationship between the Metropolitan Police and Lucan's social circle was strained. Some officers complained that an Eton Mafia worked against them. Susan Maxwell Scott refused to add to her statement, and when Aspinall's mother, Lady Osborne, was asked if she could help locate Lucan's body, she replied, and I quote, The last I heard of him, he was being fed to the tigers at my son's zoo, end quote, prompting the police to search the house and the animal cages there. Police searched 14 country houses and estates, including Holcombe Hall and Warwick Castle, but to no avail. Amidst concerns expressed by the Labour MP Marcus Lipton that some people were being a bit snooty with the police, Benson wrote a letter to the editor to the Times asking him to either identify those people or kindly withdraw his remarks. To their cost, Private Eye accused Goldsmith of being at the Claremont meeting when he was actually in Ireland. Elves went to see Lady Lucan in hospital and was reportedly sh deeply shocked by both her appearance and her statement. Who's the mad one now? Elvis was apparently unhappy at some of the negative press coverage of the Countess and was later ostracised by his friends for his part in an article critical of Lucan, which appeared in the Sunday Times magazine. He committed suicide in September of 1975. Rivette's case made headlines around the world, and within days of the murder, newspapers reported on Lady Lucan's statements to the police with claims that she had pretended to collude with her husband to ensure her safety. In January 1975, Lady Lucan gave an exclusive interview to the Daily Express. She also appeared in a murder reconstruction in the same newspaper, complete with posed photographs taken inside the home. Now we come to the inquest. The inquest into Sandra Rivette's death opened on the 13th of November 1974 and was led by the coroner for Inner West London, Gavin Thurston. Two witnesses were called to the courtroom, which was packed with reporters. Roger Rivette, who confirmed that he had identified his wife's body, and the pathologist Keith Simpson, who confirmed that Rivette had died from being hit on the head with a blunt instrument. At Ranson's request, the hearing was then adjourned. Further adjournments were made on the 11th of December 1974 and the 10th of March 1975, before a full inquest was scheduled for the 16th of June. June 1975. The hearing began with introductions from various legal representatives, including a lawyer hired for Lucan by his mother. Thurston introduced the jury to the case and explained their duties. He had selected 33 witnesses to be called over the following few days, including Lady Lucan, who each day wore a dark coat and white headscarf. Thurston questioned her on her relationship with Lucan, her marriage, her financial affairs, her employment of Rivette, and what happened on the night of the attack. The Dowager Countess's Queen's Council attempted to ask Lady Lucan about the nature of their relationship or if she hated her husband. Thurston ruled this line of questioning inadmissible. Woman Detective Constable Sally Blower, who had taken a statement from Lady Frances Lucan on the 20th of November 1974, read the young girl's words to the court. Frances had heard a scream and a few minutes later had watched as her mother, blood on her face, and father had entered the room. Her mother had then sent her to bed. She later heard her father calling for her mother, asking where she was, and watched as he left the bathroom and walked downstairs. She also described how her vet did not normally work on Thursday nights. The landlord of the Plumber's Arms described how Lady Lucan had entered his bar covered head to toe in blood before she fell into a state of shock. He claimed that she shouted, Help me, help me, I've just escaped from being murdered, and my children, my children, he's murdered my nanny. End quote. Simpson outlined his post-mortem examination, concluding that death was caused by blunt head injuries and inhalation of blood. He confirmed that the lead pipe found at the scene was most likely responsible for Rivette's injuries, some to the left eye and mouth. He thought more than likely to have been caused by punches from a clenched fist. The last person to confirm seeing Lucan alive, Susan Maxwell Scott, told the court that Earl looked dishevelled and his hair a little ruffled. His trousers had a damp patch on the right hip. Lucan told her that he was walking or passing by the Lower Belgrave Street residence when he saw Veronica being attacked by a man. He let himself in but slipped in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. He then told Maxwell Scott that the attacker ran off and that Veronica was very hysterical and accused him of having hired a hitman to kill her. Here's another little quote. I will record that Sandra Eleanor Rivette died from head injuries that at 10.30pm on the 7th of November 1974 she was found dead at 46 Lower Belgrave Street and that the following offence was committed by Richard John Bingham, Earl of Lucan, namely the offence of murder. Gavin Thurston.
End quote. Once the hearing had ended, Thurston made a summary of the evidence presented and told the jury their options. At 11.45am, their foreman announced, Murder by Lord Lucan. Lucan became the first member of the House of Lords to be named a murderer since 1760, when Lawrence Shirley, 4th Earl Ferrers, was hanged for killing his bailiff. He was also the last person to be committed by a coroner to the Crown Court for unlawful killing. The coroner's power to, be, to do so was removed by the Criminal Law Act of 1977. Rivette's body, which had been held for several weeks following the murder, was released to her family and cremated at Croydon Crematorium on the 18th of December 1974. A police spokesman cited Lady Lucan's desire not to upset the family as a reason for her non-attendance at the crematorium. Now we get into Lucan's defence. So, Lucan's friends and family were critical of the inquest, which they felt offered a one-sided view of events. His mother told reporters that it did not serve any useful purpose at all. Veronica's sister Christina said that she felt great sadness and sorrow at the verdict. Susan Maxwell Scott continued to press the Earl's claims of innocence and claimed to feel awfully sorry for the Countess. However, as Lucan remained absent, his description of a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence came only from the letters he authored and the people he spoke with soon after Rivette's murder. While his fingerprints were not found at the scene, his assertions make no provision for the lead pipe discovered in the boot of the Corsair, the claims by some that he discussed murdering his wife, or the lack of a viable suspect for the man he claimed to have seen fighting her. No sign of a forced entry was ever found, and officers attempting to demonstrate that Lucan could have seen into the basement kitchen from the street could only do so by stooping low to the pavement. The light in the basement of 46 Lower Belgrave Street was not working, making it even more difficult to see into the room. Its light bulb, which was tested and found to be in working order, was removed from its holder and left lying on a chair. Furthermore, Lady Lucan claimed not to have entered the basement that night, contradicting the Earl's version of events. His wife's account is supported by the forensic examination made of the blood splashes and stains around the property. Some traces of Lady Lucan's blood were found in the basement, the rear garden, and on the canvas sack used to store of its body. This may have been due to contamination at the scene. The man Lucan claimed to have seen could not have left through the basement's front door as it was locked, and the rear door led to a walled garden through which no trace of an escape was found. No signs that the man left by the ground level front door were discovered, and no witnesses reported seeing any such person near 46 Lower Belgrave Street. In contrast to his defenders, the national press were almost unanimous in their condemnation of Lucan. Their lead writers ignored the threat of libel and identified him as Rivette's killer. Now we get into his bankruptcy and estates. So, be it known that the Right Honourable Richard John Bingham, 7th Earl of Lucan of 72A Elizabeth Street, London, SW1, died on or since the 8th day of November 1974. That comes from a probate document of 1999. End quote. As Lucan's bankruptcy proceeded in August of 1975, his creditors were informed that the missing Earl had unsecured debts of £45,000 and preferential liabilities for £1,326. His assets were estimated at £22,632. The family silver was sold in March 1976 for around £30,000. His remaining debts were repaid by the Lincoln Lucan Family Trust in the years immediately following his disappearance. Lucan's family were granted probate over his estate in 1999, but no death certificate was issued, and his, he and his heir, George Bingham, was refused permission to take his father's title and seat in the House of Lords. Following the passage of the Presumption of Death Act of 2013, Bingham began a new attempt to have his father declared dead, which proved successful in a high court hearing at the Rolls Building on the 3rd of February 2016. He therefore inherited his father's title, becoming the 8th Earl of Lucan. Now we get into his ultimate fate and the reported sightings from around the world. Here's a little quote on that. He was not pronounced dead so he could pay for the children's education. That was the reason it took so long. If his body was found, my son would have been the Earl of Lucan and we would have to pay the death duties. We would not have been able to pay for the children's education. They were only 4, 7 and 10 so there was a lot of time ahead. Dalgo, Countess of Lucan. End quote. The last confirmed sighting of Lucan was about 1.15am on the 8th of November 1974 as he exited the driveway of the Maxwell Scott property in Stoops Ford Corsair and his ultimate fate remains a mystery. Ranson initially claimed that Lucan had done the honourable thing and fallen on his own sword, a view repeated by many of Lucan's friends including Aspinall who said that he believed that the Earl was guilty of Rivette's murder and that he had committed suicide by scuttling his motorboat and jumping into the English Channel with a stone tied to his body. Lady Lucan who committed suicide in 2017 believed that her husband had killed himself like the nobleman that he was. 
Branson, however, later changed his view, explaining that he considered it was more likely that suicide was far from Lucan's thoughts, that a drowning at sea was implausible, and that the Earl had moved to southern Africa. A detective who led a new investigation into Lucan's disappearance 32 years after the murder told The Telegraph that, and I quote, The evidence points towards the fact that Lord Lucan left the country and lived abroad for a number of years, end quote. Susan Maxwell Scott told author John Pearson that Lucan might have been helped out of the country by shadowy underworld finances before being being judged too great a risk, killed and buried in Switzerland. Advertising executive Jeremy Scott proposed a similar theory as he was familiar with some of the Claremont set. Lucan's disappearance has captivated the public's imagination for decades, with thousands of sightings reported around the world. One of the earliest such sightings occurred shortly after the murder, but it turned out to be British politician John Stonehouse who had attempted to fake his own death. The police travelled to France in June the following year to hunt another lead to no avail. A sighting in Colombia turned out to be an American businessman. John Miller, a bounty hunter who previously kidnapped fugitive train robber Ronnie Biggs, claimed to have captured the Earl in 1982, but was later exposed by the News of the World as a hoax stuff. In 2003, a former Scotland Yard detective thought that he had tracked the Earl to Goa, India, but the man whom he traced was actually Harry Halpin, a folk singer from Maryside. In 2007, reporters in New Zealand interviewed a homeless British expatriot who neighbours claimed was the missing Earl. George Bingham responded to claims that the two eldest Lucan children were sent to Gabon in the early 1980s so that their father might secretly watch them from a distance and denied ever visiting the country. Lady Lucan dismissed the newspaper's claims of sightings as nonsense, reiterating that her husband was not the sort of Englishman to cope abroad. In 2020, a sighting was also reported in Australia. There was even the story about how Lord Lucan was said to have shot himself before being fed to a tiger at Howlett's Zoo, it has been claimed. Philip Mark says he was trusted with the story behind the peer's disappearance in 1974. Mr. Raphael was one of Lucan's closest friends, his wife a godmother to one of Lucan's three children. Mr. Mark claims that Mr. Raphael told them that in the early hours of the morning after the murder, Lucan had travelled to Howlett's in Birkensbourne near Canterbury. The zoo was owned by his close friend John Aspinall, founder of the Claremont Club. It was said friends gathered there and told Lucan that committing the heinous crime would see him lose contract with his children for good, with his wife Veronica when in custody and the family trust as well. Lucan needed to disappear, they said, because without a body of proof, death probate could not be granted on his estate for at least seven years. By this time, his children will be old enough to take control of their own affairs. He says Mr. Raphael told him that a pistol was placed in front of Lucan, who picked it up and then went to another room where a gunshot was heard. The body, he says, was then fed to a tiger named Zora. There has been continuing interest in Lucan's fate, with hundreds of alleged sightings being reported in various countries around the world, none of which has been substantiated. Despite a police investigation and widespread press coverage, Lucan has never been found. He was presumed dead in chambers on 11th of December 1992 and was declared legally dead in October 1999. Finally, in 2016, a death certificate was issued, allowing the barony of Bingham to be inherited by his son George. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next, on Unanswered Questions. The first record that something was abnormal on the Flan Isles was on the 15th of December 1900 when the steamer Arctor on a passage from Philadelphia to Leith noted in its log that the light was not operational in poor weather conditions.